Today's reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 12. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his army together. Thirty-two kings were with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and closed in on Samaria and fought against it. And he sent messengers into the city of Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Your silver and gold are mine. Your best wives and children are also mine. And the king of Israel answered, As you say, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. The messengers came again and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, I sent to you, saying, Deliver to me your silver and your gold, your wives and your children. Nevertheless, I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they shall search your house and the houses of your servants, and lay hands on whatever pleases you, and take it away. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land, and said, Mark now, and see this man is seeking trouble, for he sent to me for my wives and my children, and for my silver and my gold, and I did not refuse him. And all the elders and all the people said to him, Do not listen or consent. So he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, All that you first demanded of your servant I will do, but this thing I cannot do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. Ben-Hadad sent to him and said, The gods do so to me and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handsfuls for all the people who will follow me. The king of Israel answered, Tell him, not let, ugh, tell him, let not him who straps on his armor boast himself as he who takes it off. When Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking with the kings in the booths, he said to his men, Take your positions. And they took their positions against the city. This is the word of our Lord. I want to welcome you this morning. Just quick, this last week it was interesting. Um, we have, and I, I work at a um, punch press factory that we produce punch punches for the punch press industry. And every company has different things that they have to deal with. And, and one of the things that we had a meeting on this last week was harassment. And, you know, you're, the hackles on the back of your neck go up and, and what's this harassment and why, you know, who's, who's being harassed? And everyone was real defensive about it. And one gal said, well, we're a family. We're a family here. And I, and I just, and I, I'd known some of the things that went on. And I thought, you're not my family. I don't, and, I, and it got me to thinking, who, who's my family? Who is my family? And it, and it brought me to think that the body of Christ is my family. I think when Reverend Amaro and Reverend Sadowki came, that was a brother. That, you know, and, and Grace, you know, she's my sister. That's my family, not some, some conglomerations of people brought together to earn money. You know, that, that's why I go to Anoka every day to earn money, not to be part of a family. And it just made me think, who is my family? You know, you're my family. And, and, all the believers in Christ. And, and that's just a comfort to me that, that I have a, that's a bond. That's a bond that can't be broken. And I, I just wanted to quick say that because it just made me think this last week when this gal said, you know, we're a family. And I'm like, well, you have a kind of a twisted view of what a family is. But today we're going to be, um, we've gone through, we've seen all these different wicked kings come to power from uh, Omri and, and all these just horrible kings and today we're, we're going to be dealing with, with Ahab. And we see that the tension has just been building and building after David left power or, or passed and then went to Solomon. The, the, the kingdom is coming into more and more stress and we're going to be looking at that today and, and what that has to say to us. But let's quick pray and we'll dive right in. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for the blessings that you give us and I thank you for how you watch over us each and every day and how you take care of us even in ways that we don't see, Lord. And I just pray that you soften our hearts today and, and draw us to you. I pray that you just make this come alive to us and I pray that you just focus on you, Lord, in Jesus' name. It's, 
I would, I'd invite you to, to take a minute. Um, today we live in a world that's, that's quite a bit different than it was 36 years ago. I, I picked that year somewhat arm, arbitrarily, but it, it brings me back. I was 12 years old, and you guys can do the math to guess how old I was then, but I was, I was 12. And a lot of things had um, happened that year. Some of you might remember the movie that would, just came out a few years back, the, the Miracle on Ice, that happened that year. Uh, some of the other things that happened, you know, when I was a kid, I was kind of interested in what went on in the world, and I would, I would read different things. And one of the things that was interesting, when I went to school, one of the things that we had to do was um, each kid, a day out of the week, had to take it, take it uh, um, and fill up a page with the current events. And so you were constantly bombarded with the current events. And that year, the quick go-to was if you guys, whoever was alive during that time, might remember the, the Iranian hostage crisis. You might remember every kid, it was like, that was just, you could copy and paste. There were no computers then, but you know, you would stick that in there. And that was one of the things that had happened. You know, a, a year or two earlier, the Shah had come to power and Ayatollah Khomeini, or the Shah had been deposed and Ayatollah Khomeini had come to power. Some of you might remember, too, the situation with Russia and U.S., what it was then. And one of the big things was nuclear pro proliferation. You know, each one was building more and more uh, missiles, and it was more and more enough. And I remember the phrase, there's more than enough. We can destroy the Soviet Union 13 times over, and they can destroy us, you know, 12 times over. And, and I, I always thought it was somewhat moronic that, how many times can you just destroy each other over? It's like you only need one. But they, th that was, you know, there was a tension there between the United States. It was called, you know, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. And so there was somewhat of a, a safety in that, that we both know that we can destroy each other, so there's a, a, a tension there that, that held it in check. Um, and if you remember, um, I don't know, maybe four years before, you might know John, um, before in 19, I think it was 1976, Mao Zedong had died. And that changed, you know, quite a bit in China because he had ruled China with just an iron fist. And China was kept quite a bit in the dark ages. I mean, you, you sometimes we forget how many people were killed and just kept in utter just grossness under his rule. He had died and a new leader came into power and, cap and China started to come into more of a capitalist uh, type atmosphere. You don't see, you don't remember what China was then, but now we see Ch China as this big capitalist empire that's just nipping at our heels for, for the economy. But nevertheless, communism had taken its toll, and communism is still quite rife in that. You know, but we look back, and there was somewhat of a, there were tough times, but there was somewhat of an ease. I mean, with, with Russia and, Ch and the U.S., the two superpowers kind of holding each other in check. There was somewhat of a calm. If we fast forward today, we, we find a much different world. And if you think about, to, if you think about today, you think about all the things you hear in the news. You know, a few years ago, you might remember the Arab Spring. We heard about the Arab Spring, and there was why I don't know, but there was a hope that somehow all this might cause an, a new time for the, for the Middle East. But what what that caused was again, dictators that held some things somewhat in check. You know, dictators are terrible, but they held things somewhat in check. They were replaced by mob rules such as the Taliban and ISIS. You know, we've seen what that's caused, and we've seen what ISIS has done in, in Iraq and in Syria and in all these different countries, and we see what um, all these other, not even in just the Middle East, you know, you know radical Islam, Islam has got many faces, you know, be it, Al Shabaab or or what have you, all these different Boko Haram, all these different faces of, of radical Islam, and we're seeing that come to come to pass. Some of you, if you if you read the, the paper, I like to read the paper a lot. And if you've read about what China is doing now, again, John, you're probably familiar with this. The islands in the South China Sea, China's taking some of these reefs and building them up. And the purpose of that is is to push out their their borders in the South China Sea and try and gain more property by that, gain more, more prominence in the region. And I just heard on the radio the other day that 
what that's causing is they're building them to the point where they're able to get military installations on some of these. They're able to fly bombers off of these, which can mean many things for, you know, not only South Korea, but some of these other countries. And so we see that China's pushing its sovereignty out and we see just um, many things. You know, also last year, Russia, you might remember when An Russia came into, into, into the Crimea and they annexed Crimea. And even beyond that, they had taken part of Ukraine's borders. They had gone, I believe it was 10 miles into the Ukraine and they were already past the Ukraine's borders. So they're pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to see what boundaries they can pass. And the United States, you know, I'm going to be going over a lot of things, but one of the, one of the terms I've heard is sometimes you use exaggeration for effect. And sometimes you, you go clear to the other end just to show your point. In this instance, we're going to somewhat use amount for effect. There's a lot of things, things are not good in these times, and we need to, it's going to help us realize what state we're in. The United States debt, you know, you always hear that, that the Dow is up, the Dow is down. You know, we're, we have these programs and this, and no matter where you are, you can't help but realize what debt is. The United States debt, it's, it's climbed to, to 19 trillion, 19.1, that was the last number that I got. And it, it's probably higher than that now. I can't imagine, you know, they've given analogies to try and point out what 19 trillion is. I, it's, it's, I, I can't imagine what, what that number even means. But what it does mean is that the United States position is becoming more and more precarious. You know, the more and more in debt we become, the more and more our, our situation becomes difficult. As we come to, to our story, to the, our passage today, we're coming to, uh, Ahab is coming to a crossing point too. He's dealing with the first king of Israel, Saul. He had died in battle, bringing David to power. David brought Israel to a, to a position of, of prominence. And David was a man that it, God even said he was after his own heart and God blessed him and brought Israel into a position of prominence within the region. But over a course of about a hundred years, if you remember the kingdom was divided in two and a series of evil kings, just evil rotten kings. We've, we've studied all of these different kings that have come, come to pass interspersed with a few faithful ones have brought the kingdom to a precarious state. They're, they're kind of in a teetering situation. And you look at King Ahab, I mean, he's just a, a horrible person. And you look at the, the wife that he took in order to, to position himself was, was Jezebel. You know, even in common uh, parlance, people know, if, if nobody names their daughter Jezebel, you know, because it has a real poor connotation. People know that even if they don't know the Bible, Jezebel was not a good person. She had put out a, a hit on, on Elijah, and, and by the grace of God, he escaped. So they're just, and, and she's brought Baal worship in, into, the, into the kingdom. So it's just a horrible, rotten situation. And our narrative opens, if you remember last week, Ivan preached, Elisha has just been called. He, he sacrificed his oxen and he burned his, his plows in order to, to signify, I'm moving on, I'm, I'm your, your servant. And this, the Syrian king ben, ben Hadad, he, he's built a coalition of 32 kings to go up against Ahab. Israel was coming to a certain point of instability. You can, you can feel it just starting to build. I mean, you think about 32 kings coming to power and getting ready to, to attack. And again, like I mentioned, and we have also have uncertain and stable times that we're looking at now, just, just as Ahab was. And in these uncertain times, we can have three expectations. We have expectations that we can expect. And we're going to look at three things that we can expect, and then we'll apply what we've learned to our lives. The first thing that we can expect is that we can expect trouble to come. Ben Hadad had amassed this coalition as an inevitable sign of invasion. In verse 1, it points that there were horses and chariots among the armies massed in the border. And a lot of times, you know, we see satellites and, and we see, you know, things that we can see armies massing. 
Ahab saw these horses and chariots amassing on the border. And that's not a peacekeeping force. That's not, when you see horses and chariots, that's the, the, the tanks and the mortars of our day. That's, that's not coming to, to sing Kumbaya with you. That's, we're coming to conquer. And if we remember Israel, if, if you remember back with the, the story in Mount Carmel, we can't forget that Israel had just emerged from a famine that had lasted three years. And you think about what a, what a, a drought does to us for a summer. You know, I mean, we look at it as all, almost cataclysmic. And, and you think about Israel hadn't had rain for three years. Or, well, they had had it by now, but for the last three years, they hadn't had rain. So they had just existed through a famine. And, and they had gone through with no rain. And if you remember also, Samaria was a, was a city that was, it was a uh, city that Omri had purchased and turned into the capital of Israel. And it was a, it was a unique area because it was a, a city that was built on a hill and it was easily defended. It, you could look down and you could easily protect yourself but it was also extremely, extremely vulnerable to siege warfare. So being that it was built on a hill, they could also look down and see what was coming at you. You know, you think, okay, we're defendable because we're able to prepare, but when you're overwhelmed like that, and with 32 kings, you know trouble is coming. Um, but we can feel the noose tightening, that the 32 kings along with Ben-Hadad are coming to Ahab to, to, to make war. And again, we're going to compare and contrast the, the, the nation of Israel with the United States, and, and we're going to see the similarities there. And so in comparison, we're seeing in our country, we're, we're seeing leaders who view our nation as a nation in decline. You know, you look back and it was like America was the, the, home, of the home of the free and the land of the brave, and, 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 and we're, we're a forward-looking nation. We're, nations are starting to see our nation in decline. Just this past year, you see Russia inserting itself into our elections. You see how they've released um, some emails. We look at how, was it um, Snowden was his last name? I can't remember the first, but he, he released a bunch of, of documents from WikiLeaks and, and he went to Tokyo, I think, and, and then he finally ended up in Russia. He's, he's in exile in Russia now. And so they're inserting themselves trying to just kind of stick it to us a bit. Also, you know, we look at China's able to influence our economy through its vast holding of our U.S. debt. We constantly hear about China has got vast amounts of our debt. They have loaned us money and have given us, you know, huge amounts of money for our debt. And, and what has happened, a lot of times we hear about, um, the old joke was, you know, you print money. I remember when we first, just quickly, when we first got a printer, it was kind of a unique thing. And Seth and Sarah were fiddling around with it and they took a, a piece of paper and they took a $10 bill and they photo, photocopied off one side and I'm like, oh, ha ha. And then they stuck it in the other side. You know, I was doing something. And they hand me this $10 bill and I'm like, because mm. they had gotten it perfect and cut it out and it was a, you know, I knew it was a piece of mead paper or whatever it was, but it was worthless. I mean, that was worthless. And but on the same token, that's what the United States does. They, you know, we'll, we'll print more money. We'll just generate more money and print more money. And as all of you know, what that does is it reduces the value of our money. The money that you and I hold in our, our pocket each day gets less and less. And and when that happens, countries lose faith in the value of our, our dollar. And one thing thankfully that hasn't happened yet is you know the world still operates on the currency of the dollar the dollar is what the world operates but there's there's talk of going off of that and if, if that were to happen that would be cataclysmic for the united states because all of a sudden we don't know what the value of our dollar worth because every other people every other country's currency is pinned to our currency so once if we were to go off of that current off of the dollar it's, it's frightening what would happen because the price of a barrel of crude is based on the dollar. It's not based on the yen or the, the yuan or anything like that. So, and we also look at this last year, some of you might remember Iran um, 
Iran, they captured 10 of our Navy soldiers after they supposedly went into Iranian waters. You know, I remember seeing pictures on, on the news about that. And just recently, you know, we think about the United States sending that money to um, Iran in all these different currencies and on and on and on, and somehow that was pinned to their release. I don't know how, if, if it was like a tit for tat type thing, but it was supposedly money that was owed. It wasn't a ransom, but it was owed and on and on. But it, it was just a, a real fishy situation. And we see that going on. We're seeing these smaller countries kind of just tweaking the United States and, and tweaking our, our, our country. I also read a, uh, and our, I mean the West, the West in general is what I mean by us. And, I, you know, I, again, you know, amount for effect. I, I remember a, reading an article that although Russia and China, when I was growing up, they were both communist countries. And, and, and they're like, but they're kind of enemies. They don't get along. I mean, they, there was a real animosity there. But, and so they've not always seen eye to eye. There's always been a, a contentiousness there. But the one thing, they're starting to come together more and more now, and, and what is that centering around? What is, what is the common denominator there? And the common denominator is that they have a common enemy, which is the West. They're starting to view us as more and more of a detriment, so they're finding a common, common something in common with each other. And, and finally, we look at, we see Europe and the European Union is in turmoil. We see this last year with the refugee crisis coming in. And we see terrorist, ter terrorist attack after terrorist attack. It's just horrendous. You know, we think about the, the ones that went on in France, the, the one that just happened in, in Turkey that um, a 12-year-old boy blew up himself at a, at a, at a wedding, you know, to, to kill, and he killed a lot of kids his age around him. And we need to realize that trouble is coming. It's not coming, it's come, it's here. That's one thing that you and I can expect in these times is that trouble is coming. And we can just, we can look forward to uh, other countries taking advantage of problems arising in the West. We see that all the time as they see weaknesses, you know, just as in a boxing match, if, a, if a, an opponent sees someone drop his gloves or if he stumbles, they're gonna see that and step in and take advantage of that. So we need to remember that trouble is coming. The second thing that we can expect to come is we need to think of leaders to think selfishly of themselves, which, surprise, surprise. When Ahab was confronted with certain defeat, he immediately capitulated. You think about, here he is, he, he sees these armies coming to him. In our passage, Ahab offers little to no resistance to the first threat from Ben-Hadad. What was his first response in, in verse four? It says, and the king of Israel answered, As you say, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. That's not a strong statement for a, a, a leader that's leading. I think about you're, you're just immediately giving over who you are and what you have. In this, if you think about that, think about the situation that, that Ahab was in. He, he gives this statement, the first point, the first time he comes up against resistance, the first time that Ben Hadad is coming at him. What, think about what the mercy that God has already shown Ahab. Think about what he's already shown, the mercy that he's shown to Ahab. The miracles that he's shown. God has not been silent. Ahab has seen God at work. In, there, there's probably more than four, but I, I mentioned four here. Um, he, he put, what he, Ahab puts his faith in his ability to negotiate and, and for ill, he, he hopefully is hoping that somehow Ben-Hadad will have mercy. Why? I don't know. He thinks that maybe somehow Ben-Hadad will have mercy on him. But the mercy that God had shown, God showed him in, again, I said four instances, there's probably more. You know, Elijah comes to him and he predicts the drought. He says a drought is coming and, it, and it's going to come. He brings a drought to pass, so he, he, he proves that Elijah was a man of God that, God, that Elijah was saying the truth. He brings the drought to pass. Again, Elijah go up on the, on the uh, Mount Carmel, 
and, he, and, and God sends down fire after Elijah had prayed the after Elijah had prepared the, the sacrifice in a negative way of pouring the water on it, digging the trench around it, Elijah made, God had Elijah make it so there's no chance to not believe that it was God who had done that. So Elijah predicted the drought. He brought the drought to pass. He burns up the sacrifice with fire, and he predicts and ends the drought. So Ahab isn't in a bubble. He sees what God can do. He has... He knows the power of God. He can't escape that fact. But yet he capitulates and says, you know what, I'm going to go on my, not my knowledge. I'm going to go on maybe Ben-Hadad will relent. Let's see how it goes. Let's see what happens. And as we look at that, we see in, in a couple of chapters book before what Jezebel did, going after Elijah, trying to have him killed. And now Ahab, you know, going after after capitulating to, to Ben-Hadad, we're seeing that these are two of the most prideful and self-serving king and queen Israel had seen. This was just a dynamic duo, you know, to coin a cheesy phrase, of just horrendousness. I mean, they were just horrible people. And if, if you're familiar with, with history, this might sound familiar, the, the capitulation. That If you remember Neville Chamberlain signing the Munich Agreement, ceding the German-speaking Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia, I remember seeing him, you know, old video of him getting off the plane and saying, I've signed a, 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 an agreement with Hitler and, and we're, we're going to give him that portion of, of Germany, of Czechoslovakia, and everything is going to be good and, and, and all, all is well. Well, shortly thereafter, you know, many of you remember that not, Hitler just came on and, and he never stopped until he was finally stopped by uh, the Allied powers. You might also remember, I mentioned Russia taking over the Crimea, was it a year or two ago? The, the inaction there, you know, they said this is a horrible thing, this is a, a, a terrible thing. But NATO, they allowed it to be annexed by their, from the Ukraine by its, in, by its inaction. You know, I remember seeing on some of the different, you know, quote, news shows, they said, well, it's okay. It's okay to, to let Crimea go because they're more of a Russian-speaking group, and they're more they fit more better they fit better into Russia than they would the the Ukraine. So we'll let that go. And I just thought this is such a bizarre state of affairs that you're allowing you're just okay with that going. But that we see groups doing that and leaders doing that, just allowing things to happen. You know, the go along to get along mentality, and, and you see we'll see what that happens. Another thing, we can see leaders often loot their country at the expense of their citizens. Some examples of this uh, include, again, some of you might remember, I believe, it, I can't remember, was it the late 80s, but Fernando and Imelda Marcos, you might remember, you know, how they just pillaged their, their country. I, I think it was Imelda that, did she have 4,000 pairs of shoes or something? You know, and, and I don't think anybody can relate to that. Maybe, maybe some could, I don't know, but <laughs> 4,000 pairs of shoes. But another one is, is Idi Amin from Uganda. You look at how he just tr trashed that country, and he was finally, I think he, he left and he was exiled in, in Saudi Arabia, and he died there. Or um, Mao Zedong, I remember reading as a kid when um, Reader's Digest used to be kind of the end thing. And, you know, I didn't, we had five, five channels of television, so that's when kids actually read. So I'm, I'm reading about China, and I'm reading about Mao Zedong, and I'm like, this is bizarre what this guy did to his country and what he was willing to do to his country and how twisted it was and, and how he, he had no qualms about killing his people. And, and just one more, I think, about Stalin, and, the, you know, you read about the Stalinist purges. And... You know, we, we see, and it was a horrible thing. We think about 9-11 and, and 3,000 people dying. We, but in, in Russia and China, in China, it was millions and me, millions and millions of people dying and, and mass graves with no headstones. There, is, there were no, you know, we, we can't fathom that. But people, 
long story short, leaders will, will enrich themselves at the expense of their constituents. They're, they don't have their constituents at, in their best interest. And, you know, lest, lest we think that, well, we're better than that, you know, we haven't escaped controversy ourselves. In 1970, you know, some of you might remember Watergate, you know, and that was, I remember growing up, I was kind of younger, but I kept hearing the word Watergate. And we think about, you know, it resulted in, in the president's um, impeachment and resignation. And again, during the 90s, you know, you remember our president then, the things that went on were just horrendous. I, I remember hearing on the news some of the, the stories that went on with with the president at that time. And I, I look in it, his actions just tarnished the office, the office of president. And I, and I look in what, what his actions did to give the youth, the youth of um, say like 12, 12 years old and on, it gave them just perverted, newly perceived sexual boundaries that, well, that must be okay. And it, and it just, made my blood boil that, that his actions somehow made it look to other young kids and, and, you know, certain generations that things are okay to do. And it, it just absolutely bothered me. But I, we haven't escaped controversy as, at all. And certainly our current presidential election has turned into the talk of the world about its dysfunction. I, I look back at the, um, the debates and it was just like, I, I, I can't imagine what's going to be said next. I can't imagine what's, what's going to go on. So those are two expectations. Trouble is coming and we can expect leaders to look out for themselves. Third, we need to expect that God is going to rule. That's the thing that we need to remember. Fortunately for Ahab, God showed his glory in spite of Ahab. I know we read... Uh, verses 1 through 12, but if you turn in your Bibles, look at, at 1 Kings 20, 13 and 14. And behold, a prophet came near to the Ahab, king of Israel, and said, Thus says the Lord, Have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will give into your hand this day, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? He said, Thus says the Lord, By the servants of the governors of the districts, then he said, who shall begin the battle? And he answered, you. That points to us. We see how Ahab was just a wretch. We, we see how Ahab, who did, who did Ahab go to in his time of trouble? He went to himself. He went to himself and he went to his, his elders. You know, we look and we think, instead of calling upon the name of the Lord, after seeing all that God had done, and, and shown his glory. Ahab went to himself and he went to his own reasoning and that's who he put his faith and trust in. We need to realize that God doesn't rely on man and that God was going to defeat Ben-Hadad in spite of Israel being outnumbered and overpowered. It, it brings me back to think about Gideon. It, it's not the amount of people and the amount of uh, swords that you have. It's who's on your side. It, it, it's God who, who wins a battle. It's not us. This was going to be the Lord's victory and not theirs. And in the book, The Essential Truths of the Christian Faith, I, I encourage you, you know, we started doing this for the, the children's youth group. And, and I hadn't read this one before, but I really encourage you to, to go through this because it, it's really a good book. And there's, it just covers all the different aspects of the Christian faith. But the one, the one on providence, I want to really spoke to this. And that God is in control. God, is, God will rule. The central point of the doctrine of providence is the stress on God's government of the universe. He rules with creation, with absolute sovereignty and authority. He governs everything that comes to pass, from greatest to the least. Nothing ever happens beyond the scope of a sovereign, providential government. He makes the rain to fall and the sun to shine. He raises up the kingdoms and brings them down. He numbers the hairs on our head in the days of our life. These are things that, that again, not just to go back for a minute, Ahab should have known. He, God is the one who makes the rain to fall and, and causes the rain to stop. He knew that, and, and God left no, no question about that. 
And let's quick review the, what we can expect. We need to remember to, to expect three things. Trouble is coming. And we, sh we, can, we, we can expect the, li the liberal left growing in hostility. We, can, we are seeing the, the liberal left. They're growing in hostility towards God's elect. And we shouldn't expect things to get better due to anything coming from the world. We, a lot of times, we see, uh, well, maybe about this. M you know, maybe if we do this and this, th this will make it a little bit better. Um, we uh, see, no matter what, we see with this, this just a, a year ago, we were dealing with the, the um, homosexual marriage. And, and it was like, okay, we'll, we'll go with that. Then it, 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 now it's come to transgender. And we see it on a steady march from the left, and it's not stopping. We can't say, maybe if this will get a little bit better, maybe if this will happen, maybe if that'll, that'll get better. It's not. We can't expect that things are going to somehow become better. We can expect leaders to think selfishly of themselves. We certainly can't expect leaders to look out for our best interests. A lot of times I hear that over and over and over on the radio. If you elect me, things will be better. And, and this party's more caring for you, or this party's more caring for you. And no matter what, we can't expect our leaders to somehow have some altruistic feelings towards the general population, because invariably we see somehow, and, it, and it's just human nature, I'm not singling one person out, but it's just human nature that leaders are going to look out for themselves, they're going to look to themselves, to enrich themselves, and make things better than, for themselves. The only thing that we can put our hope in is the last ex expectation, which is we can expect God to rule. You know, the clouds are, are here and they're, and they're hanging over, but we know that God is, will rule. God's glory will be seen. God's not hiding himself, and he will make himself be seen. Even in times of great distress and times of trouble, we can see that God is working in every circumstance. I see that. I see that even when times are tough, when I see um, people pass away and when I see certain things, I see that God's in, in, in control and at work in every circumstance. And in regardless of troubled times, and, um, troubled times and poor leaders, we can take comfort that God's on the throne. I, um, this last month, it was a really, I really appreciated it. If you haven't gone on the, the Common Slaves blog, I really encourage you to do that. I went on and, and Joe had written an article about the, the, the voting that's coming up. And, you know, we, we see it just getting cranked and cranked and, and cranked. And you listen to the news and it's just like, it, it, it's amazing to me um, when I see the news. And I, oops, I'm sorry. When, you know, that's one thing that I listen to the news on the radio because I have a, a bit of a drive home and, and sometimes I'll watch the news and you see all these different pundits. I mean, they just, how do I get you to listen? How do I get you to watch? If somehow you're in trouble and I'm the only one that's going to be able to tell you the solution of the problem. That's, that's how things happen. They, they get you wound up tight. And so we think if, if I don't vote this way, if I don't vote that way, what if, what if I don't vote? And, and I just appreciated the blog that, that Joe wrote that, and some of you might have read it, but if you haven't, I really encourage you to do it. God is in control no matter what happens in this election. God is in, still in control. God's will will be done. And, and that is such an encouragement to me that, because over and over, I, people come and talk to me, and I, I've just gotten so weary about it at work and stuff, about, um, well, if you don't vote for this one, this is going to happen. And, and I hear it both ways, and I'm just like, you know what? God's in control. God, no matter which way this election goes, God will rule. When we see these different times coming, God is in control. And that's, that's the one thing that we can realize. Even when Ahab neglected God and, and went to his own wisdom and tried relying on the wisdom of his elders, God was in control and God said, 
You're, I'm going to win this war for you. And it's not going to be by your wit, not by your cunning, but you'll win the war in my, in my fashion. And in application, we need, we need to realize that we can never despair. We, we can't despair. We need to put our hope in Christ who will never leave us in times, leave us people when times are hard. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. Second Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him, on him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You must also help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf and for the blessings, blessing granted us through the prayer of many. Think of that, that, God, that the suffering that they, they received was in order to make them rely more on God. And, and that's what we need to realize, that when times get tougher, you know, a lot of times we, we like to focus on, on our solutions and somehow maybe I can figure it out. We need to first go to God and, and, and put our, our faith and hope in Him and put our trust in what, what He, what His solution is. Because a lot of times it's different than ours, but it's almost, it's always better than ours. It's, and so we need to realize that. And so that's a lot of times easier said than done because especially in America, it's so, we're so quick to say, I've got it figured out. I can do it. I'll take care of it. And we, all, we need to also reject the bunker mentality. A lot of times, you know, on, um, we see people getting ready for the end. You know, when times get tough like this, once in a while when I've heard, listen to um, uh, conservative radio, you hear some of the things that they're selling. I've heard um, <laughs> it was like a culvert that you could bury underground and, and you, you could live in this culvert. You know, I remember seeing, I think it was Marie Osmond selling MREs on TV and, something, and I'm like, and, and they're selling MREs that'll last, you know, for when times get tough and I just thought, you know, who are you putting your faith in? Who are you putting your trust in? Are, are you putting your trust in, you know, maybe, maybe I'll somehow things will all work out. Turn with me to, to Romans 5.1. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings, suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul didn't subject himself to the bunker mentality. He didn't shut down and say, us foreign no more. You know, Paul was out spreading the gospel. And we need to realize that, that that's what we need to do. There, there are many different things that you know, we might put our faith and hope in. There's a, a show called Doomsday Preppers that they're prepared to get to take on the government and whoever else comes their way, and and, and that's somewhat of the fringe type things that people go, oh, well, see, they're 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 you know just wackadoos, but a lot of times you and I might get subjected to a bunker mentality as well. You know, we might think, um, well, I've got my my. Retirement's all set, and I'm ready to I'm ready to buckle down, and, and, and I'm ready to, to take on, you know, just settle in. And we need we need to, to reject that mentality and fight against it and, and get out 
and rub elbows with the others. You know, we need to realize that sometimes your feelings might get hurt. You know, I'm sure Paul was rejected many times. You know, and we need to, we need to be able to say, I'm going to spread the gospel even if, even if it's difficult, even though times are tough, even though the society is against me, because it certainly is. We need to realize that through him, you know, we've obtained access by faith into this grace. And we need to look at, finally, to the unsaved. If, if there are any unsaved here today, if you haven't put your faith in Christ and put your hope in him, you need to realize that there's no place to hide in times like this except in Christ. There is no 401k that's, that, that will save you. There's no, nobody has a program that will somehow make things better. There's no self-help group. There's no thing that you can somehow on your own heal the inside of your heart and make yourself right. I, I see so many false religions and so many just false, false things that I just, I just implore you to, to put your faith in Christ and that there's no place to hide in times like these except Christ. You know, I pray that we open our heart to repent and trust in Jesus for eternal salvation. If you turn to John 3.36. Whoever believes the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So today I would just encourage you, what, you know, the, the three things that we need to remember is that time, difficult times are coming. Don't be surprised by that. Things, difficult times are coming. No matter what leader is put in place, you can't put your trust in, in the leaders either because a lot of the times they have their best, in, their own interests at state at, in the forefront but the one thing that we can put our faith and trust in is that god will rule and we need to remember that on a daily basis i need to remember that daily because you know the the, the purpose of the media is to make you uncomfortable the purpose of the media is to make you uncomfortable and, and somehow think that only someone else you know other than god has has the answer but we as christians we know that the only answer is god and that god is on the throne god will rule and we can take comfort in that. And, and lastly, just that we can't allow ourselves to, to button ourselves up and get into a bunker and, and, and stay away from society because we're, we're supposed to get in and mix it up, you know, be in the world but not of it. And I just pray that we, we do that. So, again, I thank you. Joe, would you close us in prayer? Father, our Lord Jesus himself <clears throat> said, in this world you will have trouble. Father, thank you for this reminder from your word and from our dear brother that we can expect trouble to come. We can expect to be disappointed by those to whom we look to watch out for us. But Father, we we rejoice because we have a God that we can expect to rule mm -hmm. and to rule well mm -hmm. and to rule perfectly and to rule sovereignly. Mm -hmm. We have a God who, no matter how bad things are, the bad things, he works together for the good of his children. So we thank you for the encouragement that we have even in a discouraging uh, situation.